I'll just a quick introduction. My name is Justin Ryan. I work at Netflix. Um, the first question I'm going to ask you is sort of why are you here? Um, you're probably here because you've written a plugin and you really didn't know what you were doing. Or, or the other scenario is, or you haven't written a plugin. Because I don't think there's much middle ground from when I talk to people. Most people start off with plugins and they work through it and they get it working and then they, they forget all the bad stuff. We all have selective memory, right? So you sort of forget the bad stuff and then you finish your plugin and you don't go back to the wikis and update them. You don't go and, and write to the dev list and go, I don't really understand this. Uh, can you explain it to me? No, you just sort of publish your plugin and move on. I, I sort of do think that's the way things work and it's, it's not a horrible thing. I have done it many times myself. Um, a quick disclaimer is one of the things you might hear me say are some disparaging things about the Jenkins documentation, and it's in jest, um, and I should be updating it myself, right? This is an open community. Um, most of it was because I didn't realize some of the problems I'd run into until I went through these slides. So hopefully I will take a little bit of a lead in updating some of those documents, but hopefully this will also act as um, some guidance to what is helpful to people. So I'd be happy to hear from you afterwards what was helpful, what was not, so we can roll it into the wiki. Um, Jenkins has accomplished something that's nothing short of amazing as far as a project that's been around this long. I think any other project you'd consider this project legacy. It's been around so long. But no one here is going to call it legacy because you've been using it for so long. Um, one of the reasons it continues to work so well like this is that it's so backwards compatible. And what you, that means is as you go through a lot of the Jenkins code and the APIs to write your plugins, there's going to be some methods that are old and are going to be confusing and you probably shouldn't even call. And anything like this involves a little bit of cognitive load on your heads. And you have to spend a few extra brain cycles getting your head around some of this, the older ways of doing stuff. Because you're going to run across other plugins that you've seen before, or like a, like a blog post from someone else. And you, you don't understand, why did they do it that way? Because this guy doesn't do it. Well, it's probably because he wrote it three years ago or five years ago at this point. And you don't understand why. So that little bit is going to waste brain cycles. And I sort of think of that as, as the Jenkins zombie trying to eat your brains, okay? So there are gonna be some references to zombies. Um, but we're gonna try and you know, maintain those zombies, keep them at bay. If I can hold back the zombies, um, we'll, we would have done our job correctly. Um, and hopefully along the way, I'll give you a few survival tips to get around some of those zombies that you, uh, you come across. Um, I think it's very easy to say that we know plugins are a big part of Jenkins, right? You go right to the main website and there's a quote, literally a quote. You can go to jenkins.ci.org you know, and you'll see a quote, an extensible open source continuous integration service. And that's really what it is. It is driven by plugins down to its core. You know, you dig deep enough, you're gonna find you know, Ant and CVS. Those are just all plugins. They're not baked into the core. And that's just amazing, it's great. But it also means that when you start to realize that in your build flow as a release engineer or as a build guy, um, something might not work the way you want. And so your first instinct is, I'm gonna go write a plugin, right? That's what everyone does, right? It's an open community, it's so easy to write a plugin. Um, you know, you write a plugin, you get famous, you know, maybe you're gonna get, you know, the red carpet at DevOx, maybe the, the ship show will give you a mention, maybe you get interviewed by the Java Posse, who knows? Write a plugin, you'll be famous. Um, uh, don't write a plugin, okay? Uh, my first thing I can explain to you is to not write a plugin, okay? There's a lot of really good alternatives. And I mention them because in your head is probably three or four lines of code that you want to implement. Right? That's your, your, your business case, that the specific bit of logic you want to write. If you write a plugin, you're going to have to put a whole bunch of boilerplate around it. You're going to have to maintain it. You're going to have to wrap it up, publish it to a repository, update it. Um, that's just a little bit of extra overhead that I don't think that most people need. I think there's a lot of good alternatives, and you should explore those. Um, and there's nothing to say that you can't start with some of these alternatives and then move to a plugin later. Um, one of those, some of those choices for alternatives would be the Groovy plugin, the Post Build plugin, and the Jobs DSL plugin. So I'm going to cover those real quickly. Um, I know you came to a plugin talk and me telling you about how not to write a plugin probably isn't the best, but these are really helpful. They really, really are. Um, the Groovy plugin should be probably installed in everyone's install. Okay, and you can write. It lets you write Groovy code at the system level against your whole system, or you can stuff it into a job and, and run it on a, a regular basis and stuff. This is probably the lowest entry point to getting 
to the Jenkins objects, okay? And starting to play with them and starting to query them and do the little bits of logic that you want without having to write a plugin. Um, we also use this as sort of maintenance jobs or infrastructure jobs at Netflix. Uh, one example would be disable failing jobs. Uh, Kosuke mentioned at the keynote about more extension points for garbage collecting of jobs and stuff. Well, we just went ahead and wrote some system level Groovy script that runs you know, every midnight looking for some criteria and we're done. We didn't have to write a plugin, we didn't have to do an extension point. Um, we could turn it into later and that's why I think this is a good entry point. Um, another thing that we do is enforce plugin defaults. Something we like to see is people should set only 20 builds. You should only have 20 builds. Um, it's really easy to write code to say, go through every build and see how many builds they said to stick around and set it to 20 and we're done. It maybe doesn't, shouldn't be a plugin. It'd be harder to document. It's really easy to go into a job that says, fix number of you know, builds to keep. You, and you look at the history, you see what it's done, you're good. Um, I'll have a few code examples in here. I think code examples are very helpful for someone leaving here and wanting to follow up. I don't have time, nor do I think it's too useful to explain every single line of this. Okay, so let me give you a quick synopsis of this, and you can come back to it later. I'll be sharing my slides and the slide deck, um, and then you can copy and paste this code right into to your Jenkins. Um, in this example, we're just sort of going at the top. We're just gonna find all builds that are buildable. You know, and then there's a certain string that we're, we're looking for in the log. We go through each build, we grab the log, we look at each line of the log, see if we have that error, if it is, print it out, and say we found errors. So we've had a scenario where we, we did something wrong in the build and everyone started to use it, and we need to say, well, who did this affect? Well, it was really easy to script this up. Writing a plugin would not have been the right choice. Um, one of the things I'm also doing when I'm at that, that high level, and I'm sort of exploring the Jenkins objects at the, in the Groovy shell, I can't put debug points, and I can't uh, put watches on the variables and know what types they are. So we wrote a little bit of code that just sort of prints out what is this object, what are its getters and setters, what are its current values, and I use this to sort of drill down through the, the hierarchy of Java objects. Um, I find it useful. Another plugin that I learned about recently is the Groovy post build plugin, and I have not used it extensively, but I have already fallen in love with it. Um, it lets you uh, spruce up your builds very easily. So one example would be adding badges. You know, put a little icon next to certain builds to you know match certain criteria. Um, adding a sort of summary section, um, setting the status. You know, should this be considered failed or unstable or something like that? Um, so this is a similar example for looking for a log statement. They do it in a slightly different way, but in the, you get the same effect. But in their scenario, they're gonna have really pretty output. Um, I know the projector is a little hard, but towards the bottom, you can sort of see a little block that's a little warning, essentially saying, hey, is these, these guys call some proprietary Sun APIs. You're gonna have a hard time telling me that this doesn't look like a plugin. And this was done with, you know, was it 10 lines of code or something like that? Um, once again, I think it's a really good approach. Um, when you want to talk about, a plugin can be really small. You just wanna do one little thing, Here's like a three-liner that says, if you have this variable, add a little icon. And you can't really see the icon in this picture, but there's a little picture of a database in there. Super simple with the uh, post build plugin. I don't believe it has tie-ins with Scripler. Um, I didn't get to mention that for the Groovy plugin. As you write really good Groovy scripts um, with the Groovy plugin, you can tie this in with Scripler to save them. You can tie them in to share with everyone else here in the community and stuff. Um, they really don't just sit in a, a job and, and die off. Script is a great way to keep, keep them living. I, I don't think there's uh, a plugin for post build plugin to use it, but there should be. Maybe there will be after this. Someone should start typing right now. Um, another plugin um, that I developed is the Jobs DSL plugin. It, it comes from a different direction in that it lets you programmatically define what your job should be. Uh, in a very concise way. If you just want to say, hey, check out from Git, run Maven. You know, that, that real short thing can be sometimes hard when you're looking at a really big config screen with all these options and these publishers and all these things. You can't really tell what you're, you're trying to do. Likewise, it's a DSL, so you can add any sort of programming logic you want to it. Um, so we can use this to do all sorts of things, and I'll let you use your own imagination. But this is an example where you can essentially go up to GitHub and say, well, what branches are there? loop through those branches and create a job. And that's what you're seeing down below, where you name the job, you say I want to use Git, and I want to use Run Maven. So it gives you this really concise description of your jobs, and this thing could loop 100 times to create 100 jobs, uh, but the logic is the same. If you go and change some line here, the plugin picks up on it, regenerates all your jobs. Um, it, so it does scale well, it helps us with scale. But I know you guys came here to talk about plugins, so let's talk a little bit about how you actually write plugins. Um, 
you're going to start on the Jenkins wiki, and you're going to go to the plugin tutorial. And you're going to work through it, and you get to the end, and then you realize, OK, I just set up my IDE, but I don't know how to write a plugin. You know, maybe that page is just renamed, uh, mad, badly named. So you scroll to the bottom, there's a references section. So you follow the first reference to maybe Stephen Connolly's seven part tutorial on how to write a plugin. This thing's fantastic, it's a tour de force uh, when it came out. Um, I've since gone back to it and find that um, it was written you know, five years ago, three, I, I think it has been a while. It's also tied down with a bunch of Maven minutia, which you might not care about. It's not a very concise document, I, but I think it's a good starting point. Um, so maybe you come back and you go, okay, let's just look at Hell World. That's a great place you should start. Well, the Hello World um, example is like most examples you find out there. If you go to YouTube and you search for plugin development, it's going to have this single track on how do I write this one plugin. Um, I find this doesn't help me um, when I'm developing. I, I have a developer background. I know that I'm going to have to be asked certain questions along the way. What extension point should I be using? What, uh, um, how? Which jelly tag should I be using? Those tutorials don't help you with that. So I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about more of a mental model that we can build up. So I won't be giving you any specific examples how to write a plugin, because that plugin has already been defined somewhere else. You can go to YouTube, find examples, or Vimeo. The mental model I find very helpful. If you're getting into Hibernate and you don't take the time to learn what a session is, you're going to be in a world of pain. Um, likewise, with any th we have a few technologies going on here. You know, there's, there's Java. You might not be a Java person. There's Stapler, there's Jelly, there's HTML, there's JavaScript, a whole bunch of technologies. And I find the most important thing is that if you, when you're getting into a plugin and you hit a roadblock, you should at least be able to identify where the ro roadblock is. Is it because I don't know which extension point to use? Is it because I don't know Stapler? Um, and I think when you visit a Hello World plugin, that doesn't help you answer those questions. So if I can help you build a model and dive into some of these technologies more, maybe you'll at least know what kind of questions to ask when you get to the dev list. I mean, for anyone who's posted to an open forum and you just sort of say, hey, this isn't working, people don't get back to you. But if you say, hey, I, I know I'm using Stapler. I'm, I'm looking at this one request parameter. I don't know why it's doing this. You're going to get a response. And I think that can make you a much bigger, better uh, plugin developer. I'm going to start with something that you know. So, describable. This is a, a class, Hudson.model.describable, I think it is. Um, it, by definition, is something that is going to be described by a UI. So, that, that's how you guys already know it. You've been in the UI, you've, you've cruised around, you look at a little thing. You might not know how to take that UI bit and make it all the way back to the plugin, but it's a starting place. So when you're thinking about your UI and what you want your plugin to be, um, think about describable. How, what are you going to be describing and what that UI is going to be? It's a really good unit of work um, that I think you guys can think of. And you're probably already familiar with it. I mean, think about when you go in and add a JDK. That is a describable. It has a UI, it's been described. Now you might add multiple JDKs. So an interesting point with describable is you're describing one thing usually, an instance. Um, so in this case, if you had two JDKs, you would have two describables in the system. Okay, um, hopefully that helps you when you're designing your plugin. Um, but you know, it's it's seen everywhere. So when you think about um, the published Javadoc publisher, that's a describable. You know, so uh, same thing with um, uh, build step. You're adding a build step, or you're adding um, a describable. If you're adding multiple build step, you're adding multiple describables. Okay, so that's a real good unit of work that I think people uh, can understand. That sometimes get confused. The, the thing that's tightly connected with is the descriptor. Okay, so the descriptor, some people say that it's, oh, it's a factory method. And there's a lot of ways to say it that I never found too, too helpful. But the, the idea is it is there to describe your describables. And it seems a little meta or too many describes in there. Um, it is responsible for um, telling you that you could create a describable, right? Until you add a, a JDK in there, something has to say that you have the ability to add a JDK. And that's where the descriptor is coming in. And this is seen much more at a, a global level. Um, and it's a, a required part. And you'll find a lot of very small implementations. It should be very short. There's not a lot of work to write in the descriptor. Um, but look for it when you're looking at plugins. Um, you know, I, I mentioned you know, JDKs, but there's other things that are going to come, well, I should say, one thing that comes up a lot is extension points. You're going to hear this word a lot. And I, I really wish I could have you walk away and know all the extension points you know, at your disposal. But if you go to that extension point wiki page, there's just like, there's over 100 of them, 111, I think, is what I saw at the keynote. Um, 
it, it's hard. You're just going to have to work through it. But I think one thing I can help you with is that some people call it a hook into the system. It's not really a hook into the system. I think of it as an answer to a question. Some bit of code is going to ask the question, are there any implementations for X? Okay, so think of the SCM. SCM is an extension point. Some bit of code of Jenkins has to ask the question, are there any SCMs? And you, by adding your extension point, are being part of that answer. You're answering, are there any SCMs? Yes, yes, I am one of those new SCMs that comes out every day, because there's always new SCMs out there. Um, and I think that's very important to keep in mind that there's someone always calling into your code at these extension points. And you're just trying to provide an implementation um, for that other guy who's going to be calling you. I'm going to sort of stick to the UI side on a job. I find that a lot of plugins do focus on that. It's obviously not the whole ecosystem. It's probably not even a majority, but it's at least 40% of plugins have to do with a job. And those have some pretty good mappings. So these are extension points that you might have heard. One is build wrapper. Okay? Build wrappers gets the run before SEM and after SEM. Those are your two hooks. Okay? So as someone's orchestrating your job, he's going to call your, you know, I forget even for what they're called, but you're before SEM and you're after SEM. And that's your hook right there. Um, another well known name would be trigger. You guys should know what this is. You've seen this config page a bunch of times, and there's just extension points that map one to one. Um, the next one would be build step. If you want to be in that pull down list, you want to implement a build step. If you want to run after all the build steps, you want to be a publisher. Um, publisher is almost more of a convention, um, really. Uh, it's just a bunch of, you're going to get a callback, you can do something with the build. It's just meant to be after the build steps. Um, if you're saying to yourself, what are all these, how do I pull these extension points together? That's an HPI. And I, I think it's just worth mentioning, because it's not that scary, um, an HPI file. It's, it's just a jar. You should unzip um, anyone's um, HPI file and, and just look under the covers a little. And you're going to find a little manifest that tells you what versions that it's compatible with. You're going to see what the name of the plugin is. Um, you can dig deeper into the web inf directory, see the classes that made that plugin. You'll also see the jelly files for that plugin. If you don't want to load up the source code for this guy, for a plugin, you can just download it to HPI, unzip it, and you're going to see all its jelly files. Um, you're also going to see some stuff in this class's meta inf directory that happened during your build. There is a little bit of magic that happens, and this is why you use um, special plugins in Maven to do your Jenkins plugin development. Um, the two things you'll see in there is it's going to, Stapler is going to scan for sure the names of variables so it can do mapping. It's something that you can't really do at runtime, so it's done at build time. This is why you can't sort of manually make your plugin, you know, and you can't make your own jar. You should rely on the plugins to do it. Um, there's also a lib directory that has the jars to represent the plugin. I, I think this is a really interesting point for plugin developers. Jenkins is really good. There's a thing that's sort of like OSGI where he runs you isolated. So if Jenkins is way back at Guava R06 and you want to use Guava R, you know, 14, um, you don't have to. You, you can use whatever you want to use. You're not forced to use the system level uh, binary. Um, because you're going to be in an isolated class loader. And I know there's probably some Ruby people in the, in the room or people who don't know about class loaders, so I won't harp on that too much. But it means whatever library you want to use, you can use it. You have the freedom to use it. You don't have to look at what Jenkins is using. You have to use whatever they're using. You have a lot of freedom in that regard. So if you put your extensions and your code in an HPI file, well, what's a plugin? Well, you no longer have to extend the plugin class. If you see a wiki out there that extends plugin, you're, they're doing it wrong. You don't need to do that anymore. A plugin, by definition, is just a bunch of extension points in an HPI file. Uh, I think a better definition, maybe, of a, a, a plugin is that it's been published to the Jenkins Maven repository and it's available in the Update Center. And that's actually a pretty easy process. Uh, I think, as far as documentation goes, that's actually the easiest. It, it looks all daunting and stuff, but when you just do it, it takes like 20 minutes and you've, you've published up there and you're in the Update Center. It's, it's crazy that they just let anyone in the door to just put you know, a plugin in the Update Center. So to pull back a little bit, I'm just, let me just connect some of those ideas, right? So you got this, what you guys call a plugin that you see in that UI. Well, really, there's only one HPI file for that plugin. And for that one HPI, you can have multiple extension points in there. There's no one-to-one. -one. There's a one-to-many relationship here. Now, your extension has a one-to-one -one relationship with a descriptor, OK? That's pretty key. Um, likewise, your descriptor is going to be generating descriptables, OK? And I think that's also important. Um, in an ortho ortho orthogonal way, I'm thinking about it, um, is the UI model. I, I know people are going to come to it as a longtime user of Jenkins, so you know how the UI works. Um, so I might see if I can take a different stab at this and explain how um, 
the UI model works a little bit. You know, I'm sorry a lot of stuff doesn't show up on the screen. We have a projector like this too, and we got rid of it because you can't show half presentations don't work. Um, there is a cool command to invert your screen, so just for future speakers. Um, you're gonna hear Stapler. Stapler is responsible for um, routing um, HP calls into your system to the appropriate places. And so the kinds of places that you should think, and this is an oversimplification. There's so many things internal to Jenkins that you can do in addition to this. Some of this stuff is just purely convention, but I think it's easy to, to stay at this level. Simple get statement is gonna essentially load up a jelly script, which I'll talk about later. You're eventually gonna fill in that, jelly, that UI, that's all HTML, and as you fill it in, there's gonna be some Ajax calls going in the background, so they're gonna hit stapler. That's gonna hit your describable, because your describable is gonna know the most about um, what, is, what is valid, what's not valid, what are some possible options. And after you've finished and you hit save, there's a post. Um, that post actually hits the descriptor. Um, and the descriptor has this opportunity to, to, to then create that describable. So you're gonna see stapler and you're, I don't know, maybe you get confused by it. I was a little confused by it, that's for sure. Um, it's responsible for um, loading the UI, finding the appropriate jelly scripts and, and, and you know, presenting them up. Um, and I should mention, if I get any of this stuff wrong, I'm really sorry. Um, one of the values, I think, of, of me as a speaker today is that I'm pretty naive. I haven't been doing that this long. Uh, the longer I've been a developer, the more I'm gonna forget the, the stuff I didn't like, okay? So I'm trying to capture the stuff I didn't like, and so if I get stuff wrong, it's just because that's what loaded into my head that we need to fix. So please come up to me afterwards and tell me what I got wrong. I'll update the slides, we'll update the wiki, I'll be happy afterwards. Um, a page that I found very useful to capture Stapler is a wiki page called the Structured Form Submission. And it ignores Jelly, it ignores a lot of Jenkins stuff. It's just a great synopsis of what it's trying to do and how it's going to, uh, an HTML form is gonna become um, a form submission with JSON and those JSON fields that you can pull out, okay? Um, and pulling out those, those fields is typically done with the descriptor, at least in, in, in the basic life cycle for the plugins I'm talking about here. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that life cycle. So I'm sorry if I jump around. A lot of these things have arrows that, that point all over to themselves. Uh, so I have to consequently do that same in my talk. Um, so the descriptor has sort of three big callbacks. Um, startup, right? You guys all know when your server starts up, um, all the constructors are gonna get run for your descriptors. Well, you probably have some data for your descriptor, some global config. And so you're gonna wanna run um, the load method, okay? This is not for free when your scriptor in its constructor, if it wants to actually get its data loaded, you have to say, I want my data loaded. Um, there's some real reasons for setting default values, but it's probably also historical based on, I don't think descriptors were meant to have data originally. I, I don't know the history, but it, I get that feeling. Um, the other big callback you get in your descriptor is configure. So this, the configure is the global config, right? You've all been to manage Jenkins and, and you go to configure that page is driven by the descriptor. Um, and when it comes back down for the save, that's the configure method. Essentially, that's your chance to say, hey, someone wants to configure you. Here's the stapler object. And you go, well, what am I supposed to do with a stapler object? Well, you can ask that stapler request object and say, give me a parameter. Give me this very well-known name parameter. Um, the other scenario is new instance. So if you're on a job page and you're hitting save, um, it's gonna go back to your descriptor and say, hey, they wanna create one of these. And here's the, the JSON values that, that got passed in from the form. Um, now you could write your own new instance and you could pull those values out of Stapler. But if you look at the default implementation, there's actually some really nice stuff in there that calls data bound constructor. So if you leave new instance alone, you actually get a really good implementation that calls data bound constructor, which uh, if you've done plugin development, you've seen this. And this is sort of the Stapler magic that's gonna call your constructor with the values from JSON. Um, while we're on the topic, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what happens to describables. So I mentioned the, config, the job config page comes up and Jelly is really driving that and I'll get into that later. But there's some really cool magic that goes on there. I mean, you've all seen it where you start typing in a field and you get autocomplete in there. That's done via Ajax. Um, filling in dynamic objects is all Ajax. Um, and sometimes I find I couldn't find these methods very obvious. They're obviously in the code, um, but these three I find the most helpful. Uh, the first one is do check with the name of your field. 
<clears throat> if you follow this basic convention, um, this will get called to validate your field. Um, there's a do fill items, and this is to fill in a field. So if you have a select box and you want to shove a bunch of values into it, you implement do fill foo items. Um, an example would be the JClouds, JClouds plugin where they offer a bunch of hardware types that you can load up for boxes. They implemented do fill foo items to say what the possible hardware types are. Um, the third uh, callback you get is do autocomplete. So as the user's typing and you get that magic. Um, um, when I find it a little confusing that when your describable is being saved, it's going through the descriptor, but when it's being loaded up, it's actually Xstream that's going to load the XML from the file si system. So there's these two entry points. If you start thinking that your constructor is always going to get called, you're going to get burned. Okay, you got to remember your constructor is called when think people are hitting save. Otherwise, Xstream is just going to magically load it up. And if you want to know more about that magic, look into Xstream. Okay, that's the 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 thing to look up. Um, something that you might find that isn't really in the Jenkins doc, that's in the Xtreme docs, would be read resolve. This is a case where um, you've changed your describable, you've changed the XML, a field no longer exists, and you don't want to keep it around forever. This is a hook that lets you um, take care of that scenario, because it does happen. And you've probably all seen a Jenkins startup, and you look in the logs, and there's like 100 errors in there, because some plugin changed their, their, their layout or something like that. That's because they probably didn't implement read resolve. Um, I don't think this is a particularly interesting example, but it shows how when you're in your configure block for your descriptor, you pull out those JSON values, that request.getParameter, and you pull them out and you put it on your descriptor, and now your descriptor is, is live, right? Because the descriptor is going to stay in memory. It's a sort of static variable that's always there. And so this is you updating that, that, that static instance that's, that's running in there. Um, if you don't save that back to the file system, it's not saved. So as you see in the bottom, you have to call save. Um, this is a case where I've done a bunch of development, I'm hit doing some work, yep, save my variables, I shut down Jenkins, I bring it back up, and I lose everything. Call save. So one question to the audience. What, have I, what, have, what big area do you guys think I have missed so far? I sure hope I have a slide for it. No one? Then you guys have not ever written a plugin, because you have the right stapler, uh, jelly code, okay? Um, I had done JSPs a long time ago, and I purposely forgot all about them, and then I get to Jelly, and I, I think I had cognitive distance and didn't let myself believe this is JSPs, and I really had to do this again. Um, it will feel a little bit antiquated. Uh, they are, it's XML, and it's executable XML, okay? And it's run on the server, and some stuff, the model sometimes can be hard because it's running the server. Sometimes you want to do a loop, and the loop is going to happen on the server. But then you want it to output HTML. It's, this is hard, right? All web frameworks have a tough time with this, and everyone takes different approaches. And this is how you do it in, in, in Jenkins. Um, the best thing I can tell you is to look at other examples. Okay, So one thing you'll see is that they're always in a, a directory with the same package name and the name of the describable that it is describing. Okay, And I'll show you a sample of that in, in, in a moment and stuff. Um, I say that it's bad, and then I, then I say, oh, well, this is alternative. This is, you could write it in Groovy. Well, I, I will admit, as much as I do have views that are in Groovy, if you're new to this and you're trying to learn how these tags work, trying to you put an abstraction layer over it, um, a admittedly poorly described um, abstraction layer, could get you more confused. So I'd say stick with the most simple, straightforward jelly you can, and then you can migrate to, to, to Groovy later. Um, likewise. Well, maybe not likewise. If you're using Eclipse, Eclipse is actually going to complain um, that you're putting, you have a package name that has the same name as a class. It makes perfect sense from, um, from a, a system framework why did it was done like that. Eclipse just isn't happy. You're going to see warnings, just move on. It's pretty obvious that Kosuke uses IntelliJ, I think. Um, I didn't spend much time on previous samples, but I spent a little bit of time on this, because I do think it can be a, a real source of confusion. Um, this is a really simple Jelly script. It's XML. So you're going to see a J colon at the beginning, and you're not going to know what that is. Well, in uh, XML land, that's called a namespace. Okay, So you see right after it an XML NS. That stands for namespace. And there's a few namespaces defined here. Um, I don't even use them all, but for some reason they're here. Um, but some of them are useful, some are not. So the first one is Jelly core. 
And now Jelly does exist outside of Jenkins and it has its own documentation. And if you Google for Jelly colon core, you actually will get good documentation. I would highly recommend that you go Google the Jelly documentation. Just suck it up, read the documentation top to bottom. Um, if something sounds weird, just move right past it. There are methods in co Jelly core to create a new thread. Why you would be creating a new thread in your UI layer, I have no idea. There is a call for muting the output. The whole point is you're trying to output. Why would you be muting it? Um, there's a whole bunch of, I'd say, confusing calls in there that you can just ignore. But there's some also useful ones. Um, there is one to do a while loop, okay? So this is where if you did in Groovy, it'd be really simple to do a while loop. But I'm saying stay in XML land just, just for a little bit and use uh, Jelly Core's while loop. Um, it also has an equivalent of an if-else statement. You're gonna feel like you're in ant land just for a little while. It's not that bad. Um, some of the other namespaces that are relevant, um, I, I put, you'll commonly see namespace stabler, but you don't have to use it. I think when you keep to the really simple um, canonical examples, you might not need to call stapler yourself. Let some of the Jenkins magic uh, work on your behalf. Um, let's see, we got liblayout, libhudson, and libform. These all come from the Jenkins plugin, and I would say most people just literally download the Jenkins source code and look at these things, okay? Um, it's, in Jelly, it's all very self-referential in that this namespace can call an other namespace that can look, call an other namespace, and you just have to sort of drill down to it because the documentations aren't, aren't stellar. I think it, last time I looked, the documentation for um, the Jenkins stuff was updated maybe two years ago, and even if it was updated today, I don't think there'd be anything new in there. I think F entry that I mentioned here um, is absolutely magical. This is gonna do so much for you. And you're gonna find a lot of examples out there where people don't leverage that magic. I hope I did the magic here, I really do. This is, it's still a weak point for me. Um, but in that magic, if you go to the docs, it just says TBD. <laughs> you know, go look it up. Um, magic shouldn't work like that. And I, I can't offer you all the magic that it does currently. Um, but in this example, what you're seeing here is that F entry um, is, is wrapping a, a text box. Now I should mention that what you're trying to do output is HTML, right? You're, you're building a web page here, right? You could just put HTML in this whole page and just ignore some of this namespace stuff. You could just write HTML, please. Do it if that suits you. Um, you know, if you want to put a flying elephant picture in there, just do an image tag, it will work. Um, but when you're doing it like this, the F entry can detect that inside of it is a form element. Oh, and it knows about that form element. So you told it, well, a title. Because if you think of a form element, if you just put a form element in an HTML page, just a box. Well, that's pretty useless. You really want like, you know, some wording to the left of it. And you probably want a box. You want a little help tag and stuff. That's what F entry is doing. It's going to render you a beautiful little line that shows you, you know, it's going to indent it. It's going to put a name in there. It's going to give you a text box, give you a little help screen. Um, that help button, that's the magic that's coming from F entry. Um, the mapping of what field should be put into the F text box, that's coming from F entry. Um, you'll see old examples where people will do, you know, this F colon text box, and they'll actually put value equals, and they'll use the value that, that you're trying to put in there, and then they give it a name so it comes back into the system with the same name. It's very repetitive, and I completely understand why it was done that way, but keep it simple. Um, likewise, I wish I had an example for F section or F advanced. I would have liked to visually show you, but given this projector, probably wouldn't have shown up anyways. Um, but you've all seen F section. F section just puts a little div around your box and, 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 and so it no, everyone knows that it's your plugin that they're, they're configuring it. It'd be really easy to leave that out and make your plugin look like the plugin right above it. Um, but I'd say spend some time with Jelly. It's not that bad. Just hunker down, you know, get a coffee, read the docs. It won't be that bad. Um, there are really good references, right? Every plugin's got some of this UI code. You just need to find it, okay? So, I don't know if it's obvious to everyone else, but essentially there is a simple path. Now that you understand the describable, if you can find out what is being described, you can go to the file system for this plugin and find the, the global config file, the, the files that are shown on the job config screen. You can work it all backwards once you know what, what you're trying to, to describe. Um, and they have a very simple path, right? Don't think they're, oh, I got jelly files everywhere, I don't know where they are. No, there is a very concise format here. And, Yes, you could override it, you could change it, but most people follow, follow the defaults. Um, let me talk a little bit about the plugin ecosystem. So when I talk about using other plugins as reference, I really think that is the best way to go. 
and for, for some examples of stuff that you should look at that are done in a very modern um, canonical way would be the associate file plugin. Um, I thought it was just, I thought Andrew was just being biased when he told me to use it, but I looked at it and it really is a good modern example. Um, likewise, Hello World is actually very good. Okay, these, these are good things to start with. It's very easy to look at a blog, parse, blog post from five years ago and have it just throw you off track. Okay, try and stay with the modern. Um, likewise, there's this TEPCO plugin up there. Now, it's got like five installs. Okay, there's no way you, any of you guys have heard of it. All it does is show like power usage in Japan. Okay, but um, it is a widget, and it's a really good, succinct example of how to do a widget. Um, and I, I think there's room for a, a list in, in the confluence to show you what are some good examples so you don't go off track. Okay, I think I'll, this is one of the things I probably would put in there. Um, there are some plugins to stay away from. Obviously, there's the old ones, but I don't know what the, they all are. Uh, but something like the static analysis plugin. I love the static analysis plugin. I, I too, am implementing a static analysis plugin. Um, but it's done in such a way to abstract out a lot of concepts. And if you try and use it as an example for your own code, you're just going to get confused because it doesn't look like any other plugin. Um, likewise, I've heard the job property plugin is not, it's sort of an ugly plugin to start with. Okay, there's, there's places that, that are good and there's some places that are bad. If you start looking at a plugin and it's not really jiving with other plugins you've seen, move on. Okay, just move on. Um, it's very easy to just check out a plugin, okay? So this is another sort of pro tip, is if, if there's a plugin that you think is interesting, just java-jar jenkins.war, okay? Just start up a new Jenkins, install the plugin, and just start playing with it. Don't try and install it into your, your production Jenkins instance to play with it and stuff. Just load up Jenkins, start playing with the plugin. I find some of the documentation for these plugins, um, you know, it's a wiki, things get out of date, or someone didn't take the time to put up images up there or something. Uh, but in, I think there's an argument to be had that the best documentation is the actual code, right? The code is what gets updated. If it's obvious to use, um, you'll use it and you can play with it. So highly recommended, just go install these plugins and start playing with them. Um, at, the point, at this point, there are, I think we saw over 600 plugins. Um, and if you ignore the, the left-hand side here, which are pretty much the core plugins that come with it, um, all the plugins are sort of in the same range. Um, and it's really hard to tell what are new plugins and old plugins and which ones are up and coming plugins. Um, so I do pity you. I mean, I'm in the same boat here trying to find out what good plugins are. Um, if you look at the middle of this, and, and you guys can't read this, sorry about this, but right in the middle, okay, the median of that graph, um, you would get something like the SBT plugin, right? The SBT plugin is a great way to build Scala code. It only has 300 installs. I don't understand why there's so few. There will be more, and I predict this to be like an up and coming plugin, okay? Um, likewise, there's a Bruce Schneider plugin right in the middle here. All it does is show Bruce Schneider. I, I can't believe there's 287 people that are that interested in security that they just want to see pictures of Bruce Schneider. It's also quotes. Okay, fine, quotes. Chuck Norris plugin? Way better. I know. So you're going to see a lot of times where people took one plugin and they copied it and they did their own little thing with it and stuff. And I, I really wish you wouldn't do that. <laughs> so. Um, as you look to do your own plugin, it's in the same boat of don't write your own plugin. Take an existing plugin and, and try to add to it. The thing that you're going to get out of this is the guy who wrote the plugin or gal is going to want to help you add features to it. Okay, you get like a, a person to pair program with for free if you take their plugin and you start asking them questions on it. Um, if they're they're like me with any of the open source projects I've done, I probably moved on a little bit. And to have someone come back to me and start asking me about it. It reinvigorates me, and I'll spend a little time on the weekend or at nighttime working on that plugin again. So even if there's a plugin that's close to what you want, just by you asking questions, we'll probably get more work done on that plugin. Okay? It is sort of a self. It feeds on itself the plugin system. If all we keep doing is copying people's plugins and putting it up there, we fragment a little too much, and it is hard to to merge them back in. Um, I have a little bit of time, um, and so I'll go over some sort of. I think interesting areas that are relevant to plugin developers that you might miss. Um, they're on the slide, so if I skip over it really fast, it's just because I'm out of time, but you can ref refer to it later. Um, I talked a little bit about that system level Groovy script, and you can start to query Jenkins, and you can drill down. Right? It all starts at that Jenkins singleton. Okay, there's, there's Jenkins.get instance that you can call, and then you can ask it questions, and it gives you objects, and you can drill down from there. Um, it, it's a very interesting place to start, but you're going to get a little it's very good Java code, um, but also can be a little confusing because you're going to see items and item groups, and you're not going to know what their data type is, um, or at least that's what I found. And that's where I have that little bit snippet that 
prints them out for you so you know, well, what classes are these? Because then you can go look up the classes. You know, Groovy's very dynamic, and if you're in the Jenkins UI editing Groovy code, you don't have control completion. You, you don't really know what you're working with and stuff, but play with it. Um, you're gonna see a bunch of samples that have Hudson instance, same thing, just replace it with Jenkins instance. Um, oh, sorry. Um, you're gonna be looking at this Jenkins class and you're gonna find some methods that have stapler requests in them, like why would you be passing stapler requests into this? I, I don't know, you wouldn't, don't do it, ignore those. Um, you're gonna see methods for do CLI, do create view. That's just not for you, it's not for me, it's not for most people. Um, likewise, um, something to keep in mind is there's some synchronized methods on there, right? I mean, obviously we're in a multi-threaded environment and someone needs to take care of it. And in general, it is hidden from you. But we have seen some plugins that don't play nice and they will hold on to that lock and then your UI threads start to back up because they're all waiting for that lock. And then I lose all my UI threads and I can't even log in um, to, to fix it and I gotta restart my Jenkins server. So you're gonna see some synchronized code in there. So if you start seeing a bunch of stuff uh, sort of resource exhaustion, um, something to look for is are you calling some of these methods and not playing nice? Um, you can guys see this later, I think. Um, so in that hierarchy, it is what you think it is, right? You start at the Jenkins top level and you say, well, what's underneath it? Well, projects are underneath it. That's what you see in the UI, right? User instincts once again. In a project, you know what's in a project. It's a whole bunch of builds. Um, and in, a, in builds, you have actions. And I skipped over this, and I wish I could have spent more time on it, but I, I don't think I do. Um, actions are actually one of, the, I think, the things that make the most sense. They're just badly named. So um, action doesn't mean you're gonna perform an action. It's sort of the result of an action, okay? Um, what it really is, is where you, if you wanna store some metadata on something, you put it into an action and you attach it to something else. Um, don't try and attach it to a project. It really doesn't like actions being attached to a project. I, I don't know why. Um, but the most common pattern you see is that an action, like so if your plugin's running and there's something you want to save, you make an action, you attach it to a build, um, and then if you ever want a high level project level view, what you do is you loop through all the builds and you just say who has my action on it. That is what you'll see in a lot of plugins. Um, I think I can squeeze this stuff in. So file path. I don't think we have time for questions, sorry. Maybe you can, you can come up to me afterwards, sorry. Um, a file path, so you should be cognizant. I mean, usually if you're a release engineer, you're so used to running with files and your scripts are running, you know, SSH'd over to a server and you're running against some files and stuff. Well, you don't have that luxury here, right? You're in a distributed computing environment. You know, welcome to distributed computing. Go add that to your LinkedIn profile. You all do it right now. Um, uh, so you have to use this file path object to work on objects remotely. It's not that hard, you just have to know that you need to do, consider everything remote and wrap it into a file callable. And there's a bunch of boilerplate, part of this is Java's fault, and I think in Java 8 we can hide most of this. Um, but this will get serialized up, sent over the wire, executed over this. I mean, it is fantastic uh, as, as a feature. Um, another choice you're gonna have is build tool. Maven is definitely the best. Uh, it has the best integration with, with uh, Jenkins at this point. Uh, Gradle is out there, but if you're a new plugin developer and you're having struggling to get through the whole process, dealing with Gradle is probably not your best bet. It's very easy to migrate. So I would say start with Maven and then migrate later. Um, I, I mean, I, probably the only reason I use the Gradle plugin first off is because I had Han Doc, Hans Doctor, the creator of Gradle next to me, and Andrew Bear on the other side of me. I sort of had to, I didn't really have a choice, but start with Maven and move to Gradle later. Sorry, <laughs> it is the future, and I use it everywhere else, I mean, without question. Um, so I would like to thank our sponsors. Um, bringing the community together like this is very important, and we have to really thank them for, for letting us do this. Um, but that's pretty much it. Um, just wanna add that these zombies are gonna be there for a while, but as long as we learn to play nicely with them, we can you know, dance a little bit with them. Um, but uh, that's it, thank you very much.